Northwest Now is supported, in part, by viewers like you. Thank you. It's the ultimate game of one-upsmanship, the land speed record. Somebody sets a record, you just have to step up and, you know, go faster. But a radical new British effort is underway. They're not going to take their brand new car and go 700 miles an hour the first time it comes out of the trailer. They're not going to do it. Nobody does. And if you do, then you're an idiot. Now, the quest for the unthinkable. We believe this car will go 800 plus, And all we can do is believe at this point in time. Time is our most precious resource, and how we spend it makes all the difference. For the team that spends its Saturdays building the North American Eagle jet car in an otherwise nondescript shop in Parkland, Washington, the clock is ticking. And for the dreamers who started it all, it's been ticking since the 1960s, when hot rodding, the dawn of the jet age, and the quest for space dominated the culture. At 75, Ed Shadle has been turning wrenches for about 17 of those years in the belly of the North American Eagle, hoping to break the land speed record of 763 miles an hour. He's ex-Air Force and a retired IBM field engineer, but at his core, he's a self-described pit rat who watched his father and uncle race in Okanagan before his family moved to Tacoma. The kid across the street uh, was telling me about the soapbox derby racing that goes on. Well, that was back when they used to run down 38th Avenue there up where now is the Tacoma Mall. And uh, so I just had to do that. And that was my first race car. I think I was 14 or so. Keith Zengi was lost to drag racing after reading his first popular mechanics magazine at age nine. Over time, it morphed into a fascination with the land speed record and the giants of the era like Art Arfons and his Green Monster and Craig Breedlove and his Spirit of America cars setting record after record on the salt flats of Bonneville. My dad bought me a camera for my birthday. It was July 1st. And he said, come on, we're gonna go up to the street. I got something to, to show you guys. So myself and my brother, we went up to uh, uh, a Chevrolet dealership in the town of Burien, Washington, and in the showroom was Craig Breedlove's Spirit of America car. This was the Sonic 1 car that ran 600.601 in 1965, so I think this date would have been 66. And so that was a place I took pictures with this camera. And so I took a picture with myself and my brother uh, in front of the Spirit of America car. So after that, um, I was kind of hooked. Craig Breedlove and everybody else in the game were left in the dust in 1997 when the British Thrust SSC car broke the speed of sound at Black Rock, Nevada. When Thrust SSC shocked the world at 763 miles per hour, time and circumstance had conspired to find Shadel and Zangi together, crewing on a California-based car called the American Eagle One. So on a trip back from California, Keith and I are flying on the same uh, airplane and we we're talking about the project and how we didn't think it had uh, any real possibility. At that very same time, the Brits had announced that they had just set the record at 763 miles an hour. What that did is that made that American Eagle one absolutely obsolete because it was not good past probably five to 600 miles an hour. So Keith and I, we just, the more we talked on the airline, we said, you know, why don't we do our own thing? And uh, of course, from my Air Force background, I knew about F-104s as well as a lot of air other aircraft. And I says, it's a small, fast fighter. Maybe we ought to take a 104, if we can find one, modify it and turn it into a land speed car. And Keith says, yeah, I've always watched the F-104s. They're a cool airplane. So let's go ahead and do this. So we shook hands on it and says, let's move ahead. So that's where we went with it. So this is just a conversation on an airplane in which you committed to the project picked your target vehicle, settled instantly on the F-104 in, in your acquisition target, and that's how long it took. It was almost literally on the back of a napkin. Pretty much. It was uh, one of those crazy ideas, but the more we talked about it, the more it seemed very feasible. Seemed, maybe. After more than a year of searching, this is what $25,000 bought out of a junkyard in Maine in 1999. It was a wreck. It was. Uh, it looked like it had been rolled down a mountain. It was punched <laughs> full of holes, be, had been demilitarized. It was a mess. But, you know, I, I paid $3,000 to have it hauled from Maine out here. 
We unloaded it out of Spanaway Airport. Our friends and relatives and wives and girlfriends showed up and said, what in the world are you thinking? <laughs> but within that wreck, you could see the image of what we're going to develop. So you had to have the vision. And others that were interested in the project, they were out there with us. You could see them, some would light up and go, yeah. And then you see some others that are going, uh, <laughs> these guys are fools. I remember inviting my dad over to see the, and I said, Dad, you got to come see the aircraft. And I can't remember, at that time we still referred to it as an aircraft more than a car. And uh, my dad came over and he's excited because I'm excited. And he just looked at it and you could see kind of the disappointment in his eyes and thinking, man, you know, what are you thinking? He didn't say that because he supported me. But, uh, you, you, you know, he's kind of wondering, okay, boy, I mean, this looks like an old piece of junk here. I'm not sure how you see this as some super streamlined aircraft that, that could be a turn into a car. But uh, we sure had a lot of doubters in the beginning. So a new clock started ticking to convert the F-104 into a land speed record car. But just for a few ticks of the clock, looking back in time proved interesting too. That's when the historian at Edwards Air Force Base revealed that the plane was based there for years, flying chase during the golden age of high performance testing. We had this, this F-104 and that, that tail number and so on. He looked it up and he found pictures of the aircraft. So he called me and he said, I have photos of your uh, 104. And uh, so he sent them to me and here's pictures of it flying with the X-15, the X-B-70, the SR-71. And then he did some more research and found uh, in the maintenance uh, uh, logs, you know, some of the pilots that flew the airplane. And they were the who's who of the era of the 60s. Uh, Joe Walker and Scott Crossfield, and Pete Knight, Bill Dana, uh, you know, Joe Engel, all, all the, the, the who's who of the era flew the airplane. Big time test pilots. Big time test pilots. And so we knew right then we had, uh, we'd had struck gold. And I, I think the fella back in Maine, if he had known that, he would have never sold us the airplane. So, It really adds an historical element to this. Not only that, but the uh, land speed record is 763 and the tail number 763. We said, huh, there's got a, definitely a connection here. The airframe took endless repairs and custom fabrication, but it's nothing without the power. And the good news is that the team was able to buy a J-79 jet out of surplus from another F-104. The bad news is that it promptly blew up in early testing. But SNS Turbine in British Columbia volunteered to rebuild it, setting up a 312 mile per hour test run at the airport in Toledo in 2005. So it was a pretty exciting six or eight months of, of really hard, intensive work. But we got the engine made into the fuselage and made runs. And this J-79 you've got because of that rebuild is actually a little hotter, a little better than original equipment, right? Yeah, we've, we've hopped the thing up a little bit. Uh, it has the uh, enlarged uh, fuel ducts. Uh, we also later on installed the Dash 19 uh, afterburner, so it's, it's, it's making stock. This engine would make 14,500 pounds of thrust. We're making 18,780 right now, according to the test stand data. So it's, it runs nice. It's, it's a very smooth running engine. You're still building hot rods though. <laughs> still building hot rods. <laughs> this spring, the North American Eagle team traveled to the airport in Shelton for another in a long series of engine tests. And then we'll go ahead and, and do a full pull, full afterburner. Fans and supporters from up and down the West Coast attend the test sessions, which are by no means for the noise sensitive. The crew is all volunteer and made up of lots of folks from Boeing, the military, and in the case of Sean Rondesvet, the fire service. I met these guys almost 14 years ago. They did a little static display at the Piala Fair and they were just putting an engine in and I was talking to them and I used to do engine work when I was in the Air Force. And I just, yeah, so I've been with him about 14 years, just kind of came on and been with ever since. Rondis Fed is part of the propulsion systems team and during testing suits up to manage fire suppression should it be needed. Even standing still, 
being next to a J79 in full afterburner consuming 160 gallons of fuel per minute, really brings home the radical and dangerous nature of the land speed record. On this day, getting the afterburner to light reliably was an issue, but you can sure tell when it kicks in. When this gets in a full afterburner, you feel in shots. It's a big, thumping, powerful. I mean, it's 42,000 horsepower if you kind of put it in that aspect. I mean, 42,000 horsepower compared to, you know, normal truck is, you know, 500. So it's, it really just pushes you back. The person sitting in the cockpit gets shockwave back. It's, it's powerful. Using a J79 this way is so radical, GE wouldn't even supply the shop manuals, not wanting to associate with anything so far outside the intended use envelope of their product. But that doesn't slow down crew chief Les Holm, who's right in the red zone during testing, leading a team of people with a wide range of knowledge and skills. I asked him if GE is maybe a little right. Is this the best and proper way to use a souped up afterburning J79 out of a fighter plane? I think this is the best way to use a J79. Not, not a lot of guys get to be hands-on, on the ground, and get to do what we do. Um, engine run guys do in the military, and um, there's a lot of people out there that have done this, but a lot of guys, this is their first time they've ever been around something like this. But in reality, there's never been anything like this. A homegrown amalgamation of an F-104 designed with slide rules in the early 50s, and a new platform that relies on supercomputers to prove its design and overall safety. Steve Wallace is out of the flight test industry and is responsible for gathering data and managing a wide variety of electrical systems on the car. For years, the generator wouldn't reliably come online as the jet started. Now, it finally does. The challenges that you have, they seem insurmountable. And if you just think about them and, and just trust that there's going to be an answer, if you, if you just explore everything, eventually you work it out. Uh, sometimes it takes a decade, but uh, we eventually we work it out and, uh, and do uh, some pretty impossible things. That problem-solving spirit is the only thing that keeps the North American Eagle going. With 48 test runs under its belt, problems emerge every time. It's a high-speed game of engineering whack-a-mole. Problem solving is a lot like that. You make sure you know where you've been while you're going somewhere. And so when you're solving a problem, whether it be steering or whatever, uh, you're moving ahead with solving the problem, but remembering through documentation, you know, how you got there. And that way, it's, it's, if you've made the mistake, it's not that hard to go back and say, okay, let's think of this a little differently. There's a lot of creativity in this too, right? A great deal of creativity because, you know, who's going to draw the picture before you? No one. So you draw on your own picture. Uh, I like to think of it as, as a, uh, it's a science project. This science project has produced a one-of-a-kind set of magnetic brakes that could have wide application in aviation and transportation. Just one example of how the project serves as a dynamic test bed for a wide variety of new ideas. But this science project also produces its own set of problems, perhaps the biggest being non-technical, finding cash money support to fund travel and testing. While the team has attracted a lot of media over the years, sustaining attention and enthusiasm among funders is almost impossible in 2016. Do you think people here in Western Washington are even aware that this is happening in little old Parkland? A very few. Because if they did, they'd be lined up here because we've got two Americans, plus about 50 more Americans, and a number of Canadians, that want to bring this record back to the United States. The British have held this record really since 1983, and we feel it's our civic duty to bring it back to America. This is where the automobiles started, and uh, we just feel there's a lot of, you know, if we'd have done this 25 years ago with 13 channels, okay, maybe we would have more people knocking at the door. But when you're competing with the internet and football and baseball and soccer and NASCAR and drag racing and the 17,000 other things that are on the internet. You know, we're just one small part. 
But I really think everybody that's ever came here, when you start talking to us about what we've done for the students in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, I think they'd be very proud of these two guys from Parkland, Washington. I don't want to make you squirm, but I'm going to ask you the pointed question. How much do you have into this project? Oh, I'd say personally, if, if you're just talking raw dollars, probably 250000 uh, I'd say Keith is probably 100000 maybe. Um, Steve Green, probably close to that. So, yeah. So you're putting your money where your mouth is when it comes to this passion and this hobby. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> for better or worse, for right? For better or for worse. <laughs> like my wife said, we could have a nice house. <laughs> Not that we have a bad house, but you know, could be a nicer I one. I got you. Yeah, with a wonderful view of Puget Sound or yeah. whatever. So. We understand what's being said there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In human terms, time is represented by the passing generations, which sometimes don't see eye to eye or share common understandings and interests. Most Saturdays are spent at the Parkland shop, where a team that hovers around 50 strong has spent almost 17 years building, fixing, and improving the car. While generational differences are bridged here, old school car guys like Lars Peterson notice how things have changed with the young who no longer seem to live and die with each issue of Hot Rod Magazine like he did. They're not into uh, using their hands and tools. They want to sit there and work the computer. It's, they're, in, they're in that uh, computer world, and that's what they want to do. I know my son, um, he's going up close to 40, has absolutely no interest in cars. Never did, never had one. And uh, when he got his first car, I made him help me put an engine in it. Okay, hey, you're gonna learn. He learned he didn't wanna work on them. But all is not lost. There are a few young people here like parachute specialist Christopher Green, responsible for the driver's life and needing a perfect drag chute deployment every time. He, for one, likes rubbing elbows with this crowd. Yeah, I mean, I noticed that there's a lot of older people on our team. Uh, I always try to tell my friends to come down and hang out with us and try to tell them like, hey, it's a bunch of old guys and you learn stories and you get to learn a lot of history about uh, not just any racing, but uh, just a lot of history overall of everything. Another young guy really into the North American Eagle Project is Andrew Kirk, a Bates Technical College student who, like most of the guys here, got into cars and speed because the generations before him were. He admits to playing video games a little bit, but that's about it. I like more of a hands-on experience than a lot of other kids do today. They like more of the virtual instead of more of the real world, which is well, what I grew up with, with my dad being a carpenter. And Les came up and he says, you know, Lars, you really screwed up. And I said, what do you mean? He said, now they know you can stick weld. To be honest, sometimes it's little wonder the effort's been 17 years in the making because at least half the time is spent telling stories. But that intimacy and a culture that promotes piping up if there's a problem is part of why this all-volunteer group considers itself family. And if you look at all of our team members today, they don't call this Keith and Ed's car, they call this their car. They bring their parents up here, they bring their wives up here, they bring their children up here and their neighbors, and they say, this is my car, this is what I do on it week to week. You know, maybe um, electronics might be painting, might be mechanical abilities that they provide, but uh, this is their car. Second by second, 17 years have come and gone. And now the North American Eagle Project is very possibly losing its window to hold the record. The greatest threat again comes from the British, building a radical rocket-assisted car called the Bloodhound. It's a multi-million dollar effort aiming at 1,000 miles per hour, which might quickly knock even an 800 mile an hour run right out of the limelight. We still wind up just being footnote. Uh, somewhere in there, you know, we may be the guys that they're looking at going, yeah, they finally did it. And I think a lot of people are in that position right now. They're still waiting to see if we're gonna do something real. I don't think we ever would have foresaw that this thing was gonna take 20 years. I mean, in fact, I gotta be honest with you, if you said, Keith and Ed, uh, we're gonna do this and it's gonna take 20 years before we're able to break the record, I don't think Ed or I would have done it. I think, uh, honestly, we probably always thought we were maybe three or four years out. And so you keep adding that three to four years out all along. 
And then as the project matured, you know, it's always next year, next year, next year, next year. But the bloodhound won't run for a while and nobody knows when it will. So the North American Eagle team is trying to strike a safe balance between rushing toward a record run right now and taking a more measured approach with some record-breaking intermediate steps along the way, which if things go as planned include the car's female co-driver, California-based car builder and race driver Jesse Combs. This next test session we're going to be doing uh, is going to be amazing for two different reasons. One, we're going to get a couple records. We're going to get Jesse make her the world's fastest woman on earth. We can do that by going 512 miles an hour or faster. We've already gone faster than that with the car, so we know that can happen. The next is to make this car the world's fastest single engine car ever. And so we'll put Ed in the car and he'll run something over 633 miles an hour. But what's more significant, it's part of our test program. At 630 is when we start developing these transonic shock waves, and so we'll be gathering a lot of data off the car. We've got 16 static air pressure ports on the car. We're gathering millions of measurements. We need to take those data measurements and put them in our computer model and see if they look like the computer model, and if they're different, then we'll change the model because the CFD analysis that we do in this car is what keeps this project safe. Part of our test runs is, is also gathering data to, to match that against our computer modeling. And when you know you've got a good match, then you feel a lot more secure that you're gonna do this and walk away from it when it's done. Despite your technology, do you think there are some demons that exist at 750, 775, 800 that you don't know about? I'm sure there are demons out there, but we don't know what they are until you go there. That's why we've done so many test runs, working our way up slowly. Uh, many people will make the comment like, well, why don't you just go out there and go for it? Well, oh well, yeah, we could do that if we wanted to, but we don't want to because I'd like to be able to tell the story after it's all done. I don't plan on going out there to kill myself. Uh, there's you know, other ways to kill yourself and, and not destroy a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. If you go 400 miles an hour and you don't feel comfortable, then that's where you need to stop. Because if you don't feel comfortable doing what we're doing, then you need to pull back and you need to rethink what you're wanting to do. And we've had those conversations with Jesse. You know, even Ed has had those conversations with his family about going six, seven, eight hundred miles an hour. And that's why, we, that's why we've done so many runs. That's why we've done 48 runs with the car. We've done 48 runs at, at a wide range of speeds for that reason. Anybody that thinks that you're going to get in one of these cars and go six, seven, eight hundred miles an hour the second time you're in the car is lying to you. And I'm just honest, they're lying to you if they say that. Let's talk about death. You cannot do something like this and have this goal and not contemplate it, not explain it to your family, and not have it in the back of your mind. I understand you're trying to engineer around it. How do you come to grips with that? What do you tell people when they say, you know something, Ed, this could kill you? Well, I, I, I guess part of my, my uh, background has put me into harm's way many times. And maybe it's a matter of, of ignorance, ignoring the fact, uh, or hoping that I have mitigated all the risk to a point where it's acceptable. I don't think about death. I don't think Ed thinks about death. We both enjoy flying airplanes and snow skiing. We're not on any death mission here, and uh, uh, so that doesn't, that doesn't enter it too often. We just plan and run our test program to eliminate and mitigate uh, any kind of uh, problems. A problem they can't mitigate again involves time. For five years, the team has been locked in a battle trying to get BLM permits to run at Diamond Valley, California. So the final record attempt may have to happen in Australia, if they can get the last burst of funding. The goal in 2017 is 764 miles per hour, averaged over two runs through a measured mile, one hour apart. But truth be told, the nice round number they all really want is 800. I think if we run 764, now, I don't know what, how Ed answered this, but I think you'd have to really twist my arm hard in order to go risk anything. So I think we set the record. 
and then we sit back, enjoy the fruits of victory, and then maybe we'll talk about it next year. 800. 800 or whatever. According to the computer, we're able to, to go 835 miles an hour. You know, once we do that, if we set a record at over 800 and we can say, yeah, we finally did all those things, many people will say, well, then why don't you go after 1,000 miles an hour? And my take is, I've been on this thing for almost 20 years. I think it's time to give up and, and uh, just say, okay, let somebody else take it. So if you can hold that record in your hand for a moment, that's a goal achieved. That's a goal. And uh, I think the whole team, I mean, we're gonna, we'll have one hell of a celebration. But the, the other thing down the line, after the fact, is now we'll probably have to take this thing on a tour and go to some major events, show off the car, glad to hand a lot of people, say, you know, and, and brag about what we did. And that's the fun part, that's the payback. The glory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>